presenter today is Dr. Josh Wallowender. Um, I, I read the same bio that uh, John put out for everybody else. Um, Dr. Josh uh, Wallowender, staff astronomer at the Keck Observatory. Um, I, the, uh, the presentation will be on the Keck Observatory on Mauna Kea, the people that keep it running. And I know there's much more than this to the presentation, so um, I'm not going to take up a lot of time. Um, Dr. Wallowender, if you want to, John, if you want to give uh, the, the doctor the uh, the ball, and uh, we'll we'll go ahead and get uh, right into the presentation. All right, right. Uh, Josh. Before you begin, I am going to mute everyone and then unmute you. And I would like to ask how you would like to handle questions. You want them at, as we go at the end or in the chat and I can read them out to you or what's your question? Um, we can do it as we go. Uh, I know that when I'm presenting, I can't see the chat. So if something does come up in the chat, feel free to just jump in and interrupt me, either you, John, or whoever asked the question. All right, give me 30 seconds for me to mute all and find you in the list again and unmute you. <laughs> All right, so hopefully you guys can hear me. You are good. All right, so you want me to go ahead and get started? Yes, please. All right, I may need to have uh, whoever's screen sharing stop that so I can, uh, oh, there we go, okay. All right, so hopefully you guys are seeing my title slide here. We are. So yeah, thanks Thanks for having me. Um, so John contacted me. This is a presentation I've done a couple of times. I actually um, built it specifically to, to talk to uh, an astronomy club and it has evolved over the years. So, um, you know, it, it, it initially sort of talked a little bit about the science highlights, but I, I've thrown a lot in about, like I said, the observatory and the people who, who work here in different roles we have and how it operates. Because I think, you know, folks find that sort of thing interesting. But um, yeah, so just as a quick intro, my name is Josh Wallowinder. I've been at Keck for uh, almost six years now. Um, and I'm a lifelong amateur astronomer, or telescope builder. Um, I know John through the local West Hawaii Astronomy Club and still get out observing uh, whenever I can, basically. But, um, you know, I got hooked as a kid, as I'm sure many of you did. And I sort of never let go of it at school. Um, and I did an undergraduate degree in, in physics and astronomy and then went on to grad school. And after I finished grad school at the University of Colorado, um, one of the uh, scientists who was at Colorado had moved to the University of Hawaii. And he invited me out for a, a two to three year postdoc. Uh, that was 16 years ago. And I haven't left the Big Island yet because you know, with Mauna Kea and all the facilities right around here, it's just a fantastic place to be as an astronomer um, and as an amateur astronomer. So yeah, this is just a quick overview. I got a lot of like fun science highlights that I think just illustrate something interesting about the work that we do. But I, I will start with just a basic intro here. <clears throat> so the Keck Observatory, we have uh, two telescopes that are nearly identical. Um, they're 10 meter, 400 inch telescopes. And they're composed, as many of you probably already know, of 36 hexagonal segments. So each of the hexagonal segments is about 1.8 meters across. And together, they, they tile together and make a single, effectively monolithic telescope mirror that acts like a, um, not just a light bucket, but a true mirror. So we have the diffraction limit of a 10 meter telescope, not of a 1.8 meter telescope. So each of these segments as they're held in the telescope, and you see this picture here is of Keck 1. Um, I don't think you guys can see my pointer. Um, but anyway, if you look real close, uh, you should be able to see just real thin boundaries between the individual segments there. Um, we can see your mouse pointer. We can. You can? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's funny because you can't. <laughs> oh. So uh, I'm not sure what I'm pointing at. Um, so the telescope itself, uh, these mirrors are held in place with what's called an active optic system. So we have essentially a model, a lookup table, if you will, of how the telescope flexes as you move it up and down relative to gravity. And we have actuators on the back of the mirrors that push on them to basically keep the whole thing um, phased is what we call it. So that it acts as a single mirror as you move around within gravity. This acts very, very slowly. So this is not adaptive optics, which you may have heard of, and which we'll talk about later. 
Um, the telescope is a pretty traditional for research telescopes. It's a Ritchie Chrétien design, it's F15. Um, and we can put instruments at a number of ports and we'll talk about that. So like I said, the picture that I'm showing here is Keck 1. Um, here's a picture of Keck 2. So again, it's virtually identical. There's some subtle differences with the way the instrumentation is mounted. So a few things look a little different, but the telescopes themselves are, are virtually identical. In fact, the segments are uh, exchangeable between the two telescopes. So the Keck Observatory, the organization that I work for, um, it's actually a nonprofit organization, and the observatory is operated by a collaboration between the University of California, Caltech, NASA, and the University of Hawaii. Those are our core members. So those are the um, organizations essentially that put in the funding to keep us operating on an annual basis. And there's a number of other partners who join in through one of those core partners. So we have partners from Notre Dame, uh, Yale. Northwestern and uh, Swinburne University in Australia right now. Um, so what that means is that if, a, if an institution is paying into the operation of the observatory, then astronomers at the university can apply for time. And so we who actually work at the observatory, we operate the observatory to support that science, to support the science that's being done by um, the astronomers at these member institutions. Um, there's a slight exception to that, which is that there's a handful of people at the observatory who have my job, um, who are astronomers in our own right, and we actually get uh, allowed to use a small fraction of the time for our own science. So that's the only science that is done from within the Keck Observatory organization. So our staff, we actually employ about 125 people here. It, it varies. It goes up and down as, as times change. But the staff is composed of a huge variety of people and it's mostly astronomers. Um, I think I went through and I, there's something like 13 or 14 um, people with you know, PhD in astronomer backgrounds who work here. So just over 10% of the organization is actually uh, trained astronomers. Most of the organization, as you might imagine, comes from a technical and engineering background. We have a bunch of software engineers, hardware engineers, optical engineers, um, but we have a bunch of administrative uh, staff. We even have our own on-staff auto mechanic because we have to maintain a fleet of vehicles to uh, you know, go up and down to access the observatory. So we can broadly divide up um, the different groups of folks who work at the observatory. And one of the most important is our day crew. So the observatory is located on the top of Mauna Kea. Um, and we'll talk about Mauna Kea in a bit, but they essentially commute from um, you know, roughly at sea level, which is where all the, the communities are on the big island, up to the summit level every day of the week. So every day we have at least some folks going up and that day crew handles regular maintenance of telescopes, domes, instruments, computer systems, whatever needs to be done to get us on sky that night. We operate 365 nights a year. So they're the ones that really keep things going. So a few years ago, um, we had a videographer come to the observatory and make this video. So I'm gonna hopefully see if I can play this. There we go. So I'll try and narrate through it. It's a videographer and it's got a lot of very artistic shots of things, but what you're seeing here is what's called the morning meeting. So everybody who's working on the summit gets together at 9 a.m. after everyone's arrived at the summit to discuss what is being done for the day. Um, there's a lot of you know discussions of safety because it's essentially an industrial work area with overhead cranes and things like that. Um, and to just make sure everybody's coordinated. This is the hallway between the two telescopes. And I'm gonna pause it here in a moment. So I'm just gonna pause here because again, you're situated in this hallway between the two telescopes. That uh, round structure there with the blue lid, that's our illuminization tank. So unlike other large observatories, I used to work at Subaru Telescope, which is our neighbor on the mountain, they have a monolithic eight meter mirror. So their illumination tank has to be a vacuum chamber that'll take an eight meter piece of glass. Because we're made up of these individual segments, we can luminize in a system that's much, much smaller. So that's our luminization take. It's actually very tall. It actually goes down below the floor in this picture, but it gives you a sense of the size. And then um, you can't really see it in this, in this freeze frame, but there's a door back to the left there that is, uh, goes to what we call the mirror barn. And it's literally that, it's just a big room where we keep the uh, spare mirror segments. So 
So we'll keep this going again. And here's the day, Chris. So this is gonna highlight one of the, the big operations we do. We actually change out our mirror segments periodically so that we can recoat them. But rather than shutting down the telescope to recoat during the day, we'll pop a few of the mirror segments, typically three, put spares in. And then the three that we took out over the coming days, they'll be cleaned, reilluminized, and then they'll be ready to go in on the next cycle. So we're continuously recoating our mirror um, rather than halting and doing it all at once, like a, a monolithic mirror telescope has to do. So you just, uh, right now we're actually in the structure that supports the mirror and you can see we're pointing uh, at the support structure. And if you look, those gold pieces of metal there, they're kind of hard to see. We'll get a better look at them later. Those are the Wiffle tree support for our mirrors. We have um, fundamentally what looks a lot like the mirror support that you would see on a, on a large Dobsoni. So here's the crane that's actually pulling the mirror out of the telescope. This is obviously a special fixture. And then it's lowered down to the dome floor where it's put into this um, sort of handling cart where we can now roll it down the hallway into that chamber to be recoded. And you know this is a pretty cool operation. We're doing this about once a month, again, roughly three segments a month. And uh, we take this really seriously. So normally as a staff astronomer, um, there's a lot of times when I have to call up to the summit and the typical way you do it is you call up there um, and you issue a page to ask for you know this engineer, this technician for whatever you need. On the days in which they're doing these segment repairs, we are instructed not to call the summit, do not bother them, do not get in the way, do not distract them at all because this is such a critical operation. But the beauty is that we do it so often that we're very, very practiced at it. So here's a segment going back in. I'll pause this here. Um, again, I think you can see my, my cursor, but these little boxes on the edges of the mirrors, these are the sensors that detect whether the two segments are sort of phased up or close to one another. And when that mirror goes in, they have these little arms that stick out and they use essentially a capacitive sensor to detect very, very tiny changes in the separation between two adjacent mirrors so that there's no steps in between the mirrors that so we get them truly phased up. Yeah, again, so here's the, the mirror. It's now resting on the, the cell that holds it and it's getting pulled into place from behind. The other thing we do, which is I think what the day crew are doing right now, um, in addition to just tipping and tilting each segment so that it you know stays in phase with the rest of the mirror uh, for the purposes of you know, fluctuating gravity and all that, we actually measure the shape of each mirror individually and then to make sure that each or each segment makes the perfect part of that overall shape, the primary mirror, we'll do a measurement and then we'll ask the day crew to go in and they'll make very tiny adjustments to these tensioning knobs on the back. And that will actually put stress on the mirror and pull it into the ideal shape. So we actually uh, do that as well to, to keep the telescope optics as good as they can be. So that's the day crew that's obviously highlighting this one operation um having to do with the mirrors but you can extend that to everything having to do with the the instrumentation which is a lot of optics and fine electronics to you know handling large systems like the the dome i mean the dome runs on what is essentially a railroad track so you have the engineering related to railroad track and wheels and bogies all the way down to you know very very fine details uh you know managing these mirrors on the scale of you know submicron level so that was the day crew. We also have a night crew. Um, so the night crew is composed primarily of three people. Um, we have an observing assistant, which is what we call the telescope operator. We have a night attendant who for us is essentially a flying technician. You know, they're, they're sort of standing there on standby, ready to be called uh, to go push a button, flip a switch, you know, whatever needs to be done in the middle of the night to keep things running. And then the staff astronomers, folks like myself. And the night crew operate the telescope uh, and they interface directly with the visiting scientists. So um, the scientists, when they're assigned time on the telescope, we're a classically operated observatory. There's some other modes of operation, but essentially if somebody applies for time and is awarded that time, then they get assigned a night. So your night is January 19th, or maybe you got two nights, or maybe you only got half a night, but that's your window. And so you connect with us and actually help us operate things at night if it's your science time. 
And then uh, just for safety reasons, again, because of the high altitude of the observatory, we always have at least two staff on the summit at night. And sometimes we have one or more people at headquarters once we've, we've met that sort of minimum level. <clears throat> so because the summit of Mauna Kea is so high and it's so challenging to work there, we actually don't ask the visiting scientists to go up there because it is really hard to think at, at nearly 14,000 feet. So we do what's called remote operations. So here's a picture of two of our observers. This is uh, BJ and David. And they're sitting at our headquarters in the town of Waimea, which is where I am now. And Waimea is about 2,500 feet elevation. So it's, it's up country for Hawaii. It's about as high as, as most communities get here. Um, and they're sitting at one of the stations where they will be running the telescope at night. We're actually doing some afternoon setup in preparation for their uh, observing run in this, in this picture. Um, so the way it works is that the, the visiting scientists will actually operate the instrument. So this is the camera or spectrograph that will be used to take the data at night. And they'll work directly with the observing assistant, that telescope operator who will run the telescope. And so in concert, the two can actually run the whole observatory together. My job as a staff astronomer is to interface with these visiting scientists, train them how to use our instrumentation if they've used it before, and to work with them to really optimize what they're doing. So their job, their role is to have some piece of science they're doing, some measurement they wanna make. And my role is to understand what they're trying to do and bring the knowledge of the detailed uh, behavior of our instrumentation and help them do that as efficiently as they can at night. Because we want to make sure that when we operate at night, we don't waste any time at all. So uh, Keck Observatory is oversubscribed about five to one. What this means is that when our partners uh, solicit proposals from all those you know, member astronomers who can apply for time, they get proposals for about five times as many nights as there are nights in a year. And um, so if you actually get salted to get scheduled for a night, that's a big deal. You don't wanna waste any of that time. And um, I should say also that because NASA is one of our partners, uh, this, Accessibility extends to anyone in the US, basically. So any astronomer in the US can apply for time at Keck. So let's talk briefly about, oh, go we ahead. We have time for a question. Sure. All right, from Gregory, he asks, the full moon does not seem to interfere with the astronomical observations. Can you comment on this? Yes, um, but let me bring that up in a few slides because we're gonna talk a little bit about instrumentation and it sort of flows naturally in right there. So. Um, if I don't touch on that, remind me again. Will do. Uh, other questions? That was All right, it. so uh, Keck Observatory, like I mentioned, is located here on Mauna Kea on the big island of Hawaii. And uh, Mauna Kea really is a remarkable place. So here's a picture taken from the town of Hilo over on the east side of the island. So that's Hilo Bay, looking up at the snow-capped Mauna Kea. So Mauna Kea, um, it's one of those pieces of trivia, is the tallest mountain in the world. Um, it rises over 31,000 feet from you know, the sea floor up through sea level up to just shy of 14,000 feet at the summit. And we do get snow here in Hawaii. Mauna Kea observatories employ Hawaii's only snowplow drivers. So here's a picture from up on the summit and we can illustrate some of the things that make uh, Mauna Kea such a great place to do astronomy. Um, so here in Hawaii, we have a, a weather phenomenon called the tropical inversion layer. And what it means is that the way the atmosphere is structured here is that at sea level and at low elevation, you have a lot of warm, moist air, and you have tropical air. And on top of it, there's a layer of cooler, drier air that is actually down flow from higher in the atmosphere. And the interface between these two, you have a point where warm, moist air is meeting cool air, and that's where you get condensation, clouds. That layer, uh, when conditions are good, is typically at around six to 8,000 feet elevation. So the top of the mountain pokes up above it. And you can see that in this photo. So here's a picture with Keck, uh, that's a uh, Subaru telescope over on the left, and the NASA IRTF just to the right of the Keck's. And you can see the cloud layer is well below us in this photo. And in fact, um, it's a pretty good day because you can see all the way down to uh, Kauai High, that's the, 
lights there along the coast. Um, and in fact, that's Maui over there on the right, that little silhouette, that's Haleakala, which is uh, about 10,000 feet elevation summit there. And the other thing that's true here in Hawaii is it's very, very dark. Um, the whole big island has a population of around 200,000 people. Um, we have pretty good uh, light pollution controls in place, street lights, things like that. So we have very, very dark skies. In fact, in this long exposure photo, um, again, I don't know if you can, oops, I don't know if you can see my mouse at any point. Um, there's a little light dome way over there on the horizon to the right of IRTF. That's Oahu. That's uh, Honolulu, which is 200 miles away, I think, as the crow flies. And that's our biggest light dome. That's essentially our only light dome. And you can see it extends about, I don't know, a degree, a degree and a half over the horizon there. But one of the most important things about Mauna Kea has to do with how it's positioned here in the middle of the Pacific. So what we have is this very, very tall uh, mountain rising up with very, very little topography around it. And so the air that's flowing across us at that high elevation has no other mountain ranges or anything to interfere with it. So the airflow itself is very, very smooth. And what this means is that um, the seeing on Mauna Kea is better than almost any place else on earth because of that. And it's because of the isolation here, our nearest landmass, the nearest other landmass to the Hawaiian Islands is California at 2,500 miles away. And so the, the typical seeing that sharpness, the full width half max of the images here, um, on average, the median night, the 50th percentile night, we get about 0.6 arc seconds. So here we'll talk a little bit about some of the sciences come out of um, Tech Observatory, and it gives me a chance to talk about the instrumentation that we use, which to the scientists is really important. The instrument is the thing that is allowing you to make a measurement. So as a scientist, the telescope is doing this really, really important job of collecting the light, but the instrument, which you put on the back of it, you know, could be a camera, could be a spectra, is the, is the measurement tool. It's the thing you're going to use. And so by using different instruments, you can make different measurements. And as an observatory, by continuously changing and upgrading the instrumentation, we can sort of stay up to date with technology and continue to do good science. Um, so really the scientific power of an observatory comes from its instrumentation. And at Keck, we have two telescopes, but we have 10 instruments um, you know, distributed between the two telescopes. We don't usually pass them back and forth between Keck one and Keck two, because they do tend to stay with just one or the other. Um, all but one of our instruments work primarily as spectrographs, which means we take the light and we, we you know, pass it through a prism or bounce it off a grating or otherwise disperse it so that we can, we can see how much light is coming out at all the different wavelengths. So we'll talk more about that in a bit. And we can actually mount instruments at different ports. So we can mount it at the Cassegrain port, which is you know, essentially underneath or right behind the primary mirror. We can put them on Naismith ports, which means we put a tertiary mirror just in front of the primary and bounce it out to the two platforms where the elevation axis is. And in fact, the, the instruments at Naismith can be quite large because of that. They don't have to swing up and down as the telescope moves up and down in elevation. So this picture here on the right uh, shows two instruments from Keck-1. Uh, in the background there is uh, the instrument ESI. Uh, some people think it looks like a shuttlecraft from Star Trek. Um, that's one of our Cassegrain instruments. And then the big boxy thing on the, on the right, that's one of our newest instruments called KCWI. So that sits on Naismith deck and you can get a sense of how big it is. You can see um, actually the, the fellow in the back with the, the baseball cap is Randy Campbell, who is actually my boss. He's the head of the uh, observing support department here. Um, so these instruments are huge. They weigh several tons and depending on the details can cost tens of millions of dollars to build. So each one of these is essentially almost like a little physics experiment. Now. So we're gonna talk a little bit about what you can do with the instruments, but um, I should, I'm gonna go back now and address that question about uh, full moon. So again, because time is so precious, we don't wanna just give up during the full moon. So what we do is we tune the science that we're doing to the moon phase. So when it's full moon, we'll do things like use infrared instrumentation. So we'll use instruments that are looking at wavelengths that are much longer than what your eye sees, so between one and five microns. Your eye sees around half a micron wavelength between about 0.4 to 0.7. Um, and infrared light 
is not scattered by the atmosphere in the same way. So moonlight, scattered moonlight off the atmosphere doesn't really affect infrared instrumentation. Alternatively, if we do really high resolution spectroscopy, that's where you're spreading the light out um, in wavelength space really, really wide. When you take the moonlight and spread it out that much, it essentially kind of drops in brightness. And so each little piece of the spectrum you're looking at is kind of like looking through a narrow band filter. You're cutting out most of the, the background light, but still keeping the light that you're interested in from science. So again, that we, when we build the schedule of who gets what night, we're using the information about which instrument and what type of science they wanted to do to say like, okay, this can be done in bright time. This can be done in dark time. Um, this, you know, we have what's called gray and sort of in between. So we, um, we set our schedule with the moon in mind. It drives our schedule. <clears throat> So um, let me talk briefly about spectroscopy. So I found this wonderful quote from Arthur Stanley Eddington, who's a famous physicist. So we learn about the stars by receiving and interpreting the messages which their light brings to us. And to me, that's one of the cool things about astronomy as a science. Um, if, I'm, if I'm a geologist and I wanna learn about a particular outcropping, I get to go out there, take a rock hammer, take a sample, and then I can pick up that rock and say, okay, how heavy is this? Um, I can try and break it and see how brittle it is. You know, I can do thing, the thing I'm studying to try and learn about. With astronomy, I can only ever look at the light that's coming to me from that object. That's the only option I have. There's, there's no way for me to do an experiment on the things that I'm studying. And so it really is um, all about taking the, the light that's coming to us and being as clever as possible to try and figure out what is that light telling us? How much information is encoded there and what can I learn? And spectroscopy is one of the key tools there. So if you, you know, examine a spectra, it can tell you about a lot of different properties. So a couple of the uh, ones we'll talk about is tell you about composition. It can tell you about the temperature of the object. And it can tell you about how the object is moving. You have to know exactly what to look for. Uh, the spectra that I'm showing here on the right, which is sort of wrapped around, is actually a spectra of our sun. Um, and all those little lines in the spectra are absorption lines of particular atoms or molecules in the solar atmosphere that are absorbing light at those particular wavelengths. So the, the atoms and molecules in the atmosphere of the sun are imprinting their fingerprints on this light. So we can puzzle out uh, information about composition from those dark lines. Uh, the temperature of things is encoded in how much light comes out at different wavelengths in a very, very broad sense. Just like um, if you look at a uh, the coil on an electric stove, it starts to glow orange when it gets to a certain temperature. And if you could crank it up even hotter, it would start to glow blue. And so we can measure things by the light that, that's coming off. So I wanna highlight one particular piece of science um, that Keck has been deeply involved in since the beginning. So this picture on top is basically what every star looks like to any telescope ever filled. It's just a blindingly bright point of light. And then on the bottom, we have a cartoon of, you know, this is a spectrum of that star and it has some absorption line. So what astronomers have done to learn about the movement of stars is you can watch the spectra over time. And again, I'm gonna put this animation in motion here. And what you can see with certain stars is that forest of lines, which are again coming from you know, atoms and molecules in the, in the atmosphere of that star, are sliding back and forth over time. And in particular, there's a group of astronomers who have been using Keck for more than 25 years now to use this to study the motions of stars. And what we're seeing when we get this back and forth is that the star is moving towards us and then it stops, turns around and goes away and it comes towards us. So it's just rocking back and forth. And of course, what that is due to is that there's something that is tugging gravitationally on that star as it goes around. And this is how we can detect, this is essentially our first good method for detecting the presence of planets around stars other than the sun. We're seeing the motion of the star due to the gravitational influence of the planets as they go around it. And this technique is called precision radial velocity, where it's actually a very, very tiny effect, highly exaggerated in that animation. 
And there's an instrument called HiRes, uh, which has been here since essentially the beginning of the observatory, um, has participated in the discovery or confirmation of most of the known exoplanets to date. There's four, I think I'll, I can't remember if we passed 5,000 exoplanets by now. But HiRes is actually a room-sized instrument on Keck 1. And its job is to take the light from a single star and spread it out as much as possible so that you can see tiny, tiny little shifts or tiny changes or make detailed measurements about the shape of those absorption lines. And this team has been using that to study, to, to detect essentially planets around other stars for again, uh, more than 25 years now. And from that motion, they're actually measuring the mass of the planet going around other stars. And a few years back, um, one of their students, his PhD thesis, was to look not at one star in particular, but to now take advantage of the fact that we've seen thousands of these. And also to use a combination of the measurements that you can make with high res with the uh, exoplanet transit method from the Kepler Space Telescope, which you may have heard of, which helps you learn about the size of the planet as opposed to just the mass. And they looked now at planets as a population study. We went from like, wow, we can detect a planet around another star. That's not something a lot of people would have guessed a few decades ago, um, to now saying, what can we learn about these if we look at them the way a biologist would look at a population of plants or animals? And what they found is that, you know, there was this bizarre gap in the number of planets that they found at a very, very particular mass that was sort of a little bit bigger than the Earth and a little bit smaller than things like Neptune. And what they think we're seeing here is information about how planets form. And so there's this division essentially, as, as the core of the planet is growing, as it's accumulating material, does it have enough mass to grab on to gases and ices that it can then grow into either like a small Jupiter or it's like a Neptune? Or does it not have enough gravity to grab onto those gases and you end up like a rocky planet like Earth, Mars, uh, uh, Venus, planets like that? And we can see signatures of that process in the resulting distribution of planet sizes. And that's what we're seeing here. So I wanna show you something cool, which is uh, coming in the future for Keck. We're currently building the next generation instrument to do this. hi -res was literally the first instrument at Keck. It was one of two that was here when, the, when Keck won, the first telescope was commissioned. And we're building the follow-on that is designed specifically to do this job of detecting exoplanets. And this is, you, you're looking at very, very tiny shifts in the spectrum. Certainly you're looking at tiny shifts when you're trying to detect planets like the Earth. And so this team that is, has been doing this research is also the team building this instrument. Um, has gone to extreme lengths to try and create an instrument that can do this. So you can imagine that if you're looking at these tiny shifts, your instrument is sitting there, it's made out of steel or aluminum. As the temperature changes, your instrument is expanding and contracting slightly. And that's, that'll show up as a shift in the spectrum as all of this, all of the, the glass and metal moves around. So what they have done is they are building an entire spectrograph out of a piece, Durodur, which is, uh, some of you may be familiar with this from telescope building. This is a glass ceramic composite that is used to make telescope mirrors. In fact, it's what our primary mirrors are made of. And in fact, this picture here on the top, which is very, uh, it's backlit with a flashlight from beneath, but that is a single slab of Durodur. I think it's about two meters in diameter that they have essentially cut and Everything on there, except for the one thing in black, which is the, the doer to hold the actual detector. So the optics that are, that are the gratings, the mirrors that you know move the light around and that disperse it off the gratings, the optics mounts that hold them, and the entire bench that the thing is made out of is all the same slab of Zerodur. In fact, that was a, uh, intended to be a mirror on a space telescope. From many, many years ago, the project was canceled after the, the contract to buy this big you know, block of zero dirt and that had been sitting in storage for some time and they were able to take it and use it in this really novel way to build an instrument. 
So you're looking at an instrument that is primarily made out of zero dirtless material we make telescope mirrors out of. And in fact, uh, the bottom picture, you can see that there's sort of this cradle there and you really see that that's the zero dirt. So the mounts to hold things are made out of this special glass ceramic composite. And so this will be able to make these, these velocity measurements of stars at a level where we can detect uh, things the size of Earth as we move forward. So this is being built right now. These are photos that I just got in the last couple of weeks of the assembly, which is happening at Berkeley. And then in April, it's going to be packed up and shipped here to the observatory. So this is coming very, very soon. So Gosh, we've what's done the overall the, size of that uh, spectrograph going to be like? Um, you can get a sense of it here. Well, it's, it's not perfect. I can't remember exactly, but that, that bench is somewhere around two meters in size. I wish I had the exact right down off the top of my head. You can see in the bottom photo, you can see a couple of people, one particular in the foreground in the clean suit. Can't quite is see that, the whole bench, but you get some sense of the size. Is there going to be some size, some kind of encasement for the whole thing, or is it going to be left open like this? No, it's going to be enclosed in a door. In fact, on the top photo on the back right, you can see the door, the whole bench is going to be slid into this giant door ah. where a vacuum is going to be pulled on it, and then it's going to be temperature controlled inside that door because even zero dirt expands a little bit with temperature. Mm -hmm. And so they're going to stabilize the temperature and have it built out of zero if they're doing the book. But significantly smaller than <laughs> high resin, an entire building. Yep. Gotcha. Thank you. So um, studying exoplanets um, has this whole other uh, path. And so between the time this radial velocity method was created and has been used over all these years, there's been other technology that's come along. So I mentioned that we primarily do spectroscopy. When we do do imaging, most of the time with a technology called adaptive optics. And this is where we try to correct the blurring effects of the atmosphere. So I said that Mauna Kea, we have some of the best seeing on the planet, typically about 0.6 arc seconds. We can actually start from really, really good seeing and then try and correct it even further, try and approach the diffraction limit of a 10 meter telescope. And so um, most of our instruments are built for natural seeing, but three of the instruments use adaptive optics. Um, and so in a cartoon uh, way, that's, uh, this is on the right is cartoon of how this works. So essentially you have a distorted wavefront coming through the atmosphere. It's distorted by our atmosphere over the atmosphere of turbulence. And then we take that wavefront and the light from that star and we split it. We send some of it to what's called a wavefront sensor, which is essentially a device that measures the errors in that wavefront. We know the star is supposed to be a perfect point. We look at what it is, is actually shaped like. And then we can send those corrections to a little deformable mirror, which is typically about that big, maybe four to six inches. That is essentially a membrane that covers a whole bunch of actuators. And by essentially warping that little mirror in the inverse of the errors in the wavefront, we can, we can flatten that wavefront and make it perfectly sharp. And then you get the light going through, that sharp light going through to the science camera. So this technology has been around for a while. So this is the cartoon of how it works. This is a diagram of what our bench looks like that does this. It's very, very complicated in practice. Um, so a lot of people ask, well, why don't you do this all the time? It sounds great. Well, there are limitations. So the blurring caused by the atmosphere is not uniform. So it turns out that if I look at a star and I correct it, once I go more than you know a little distance away, the correction is no longer accurate because the atmosphere over there is doing something different. So somewhere around 40 arc seconds is the size of the patch of sky that you can correct with sort of normal adaptive optics. Uh, it also works primarily in the infrared because of the slightly longer wavelengths, um, the corrections needed uh, are a bit more manageable because we essentially, we're doing just what telescope builders do. We're trying to get to um, a, an accuracy that is fundamentally controlled by the wavelength of light you're looking at, you, which you're trying to get to 20th wave. And if your wavelength is longer, that's an easier target. So um, that's one reason why we do it in the infrared. The other reason is, is that um, there's a time scale problem as well. The atmosphere changes very quickly. And it turns out that the changes you're reacting to in the infrared are slower. You have a little bit more time 
to send that message to change the mirror to fix the light than you do in the optical. When astronomers do visible light adaptive optics, we have to measure the distortion and send that to the mirror and have the mirror move at kilohertz rates. We have to do that thousands of times per second. Um, so it's very, very challenging. You have to have a very bright star that you're measuring. But we do do this. We have instruments that are doing it. We've got new ones coming along online that we'll talk about it later. In the meantime, all this technology has come along. And it turns out that in addition to adaptive optics, you can combine this with a technology called coronography, which is essentially to block out the light of the star with a coronagraph. So you create a little miniature eclipse uh, and you get a picture like what's on the right here. So this is actually um, more than 12 years old now. This is in 2009, you can see on, on the picture. This is looking at a star and the little yellow star symbol is where the star is and it's been blocked out by the chronograph. And you can see there's several little blobs of light around it. Those are planets orbiting that star. So we have for the first time actually been able to directly image planets around other stars. And what's cool about this photo is that we've done this multiple times over the years. And we can actually now watch these planets orbiting their parent star. So I should, I should give a few caveats here. This is really at the bleeding edge of, of the technology. In fact, this particular um, solar system is almost ideally suited for us to be able to do it. The planets are relatively far out. And critically, this is a young system. These planets have just finished forming and they're still hot. So they're still glowing really, really brightly in the infrared. And in fact, the star is fainter in the infrared. So the problems in detecting planets around other stars is contrast, right? The, the star is really bright, planets really faint. And in this case, by looking at the infrared, we got really, really bright planets and a comparatively faint star. So we found the optimum one to choose to try and do this. We've done this on a, a few dozen stars now. You had a question, John? I have one from the um, chat. Bob asks, how fine is the grading space, uh, spacing in these spectrographs? And I, I would add, is it different from one spectrograph to another? It is. Um, I don't know the numbers for high res off the top of my head. Um, it, it gets complicated. But for example, uh, there's a, a, a different spectrograph called low res, high res and low res, um, which actually has exchangeable gradings. And we go on low res anywhere from 150 lines per millimeter gradings up to 1200, I think, are typically used. So we switch them out depending on what the scientist wants to do. Going to back to this picture right here, is this picture of, of like a platter with pinholes in it? No, this is this is. A pretty much a straight image of the sky. It's just you've got the adaptive optics turned on, and then the star is being suppressed by the the coronagraph. So this okay. is a true image. Um, there's a lot of processing to be applied. You can see the sort of mess around the star. That's the sort of residual seeing. And there's some some tricks that are used to sort of you know suppress that even further. So what you do is you take a whole bunch of these images, and then let sort of the the telescope rotate underneath you so all your diffraction spikes sort of rotate you average those out over time so you can see that there's some of this um, uh, let's just call it noise around the star and that's really yeah. the limiting factor that's why yeah, having the planets be really really bright is really important and you can see this field rotation of stars in the background too uh, there's no background stars here those are the planets oh even further out from the core yeah, there's four planets in this image. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, so you're looking at, um, I don't have a scale in here. I think this is only one or two arc seconds across. So, and to give you a scale, there's a 20 AU marker on there. So everything you're seeing in here, if it were in our solar system, would be out at sort of Neptune plus distances. So, Pushing forward on this particular technology is sort of one of the big uh, focuses of astrophysical research right now. And this is the reason why. Right now, we've gone from, wow, we can detect planets around other stars. When I took undergraduate astronomy, you know, Astro 101, the textbooks basically all said, we have good reason to believe that other stars have planets, but we can't see them because contrast is too close. 
this technology has come along that first allowed us to show that they were there. And now in a few cases, we can see them directly. What we wanna do is go even further. We wanna take, uh, we wanna take the light from the planet that's now separated from the star and send it into a spectrum where we can analyze it. So um, this is a diagram of why. You can imagine taking a spectrum of Earth from a long way away and asking like, what could you learn about Earth if it was just a single blob that you could take a spectrum of? So a research team did this in a really clever way, which is they looked at Earth shine coming off the moon. So by looking at this sort of sum of reflected light from Earth that was reflected off the moon, and turned they could do things like detect ozone, water vapor, oxygen, all the things you would expect in our atmosphere. But they saw a subtle spectrographic feature, which they called the green bump, which was essentially the signature of chlorophyll. That's, that's the signature of green plant life on the planet. So it's very subtle, but you can actually, in principle, detect life as we know it, of course, if you can do spectroscopy at this level of plants around other stars. So we're really pushing in that direction. Um, I know I'm running a bit long here, so I'm gonna sort of charge ahead. Um, a whole other area that's been really fun to watch is studies of the galactic center. So this is some really cool movies taken at eight of the Keck telescopes observing the galactic center. So that beam that you're seeing is um, what we call a laser guide star. So with adaptive optics, you need a reference point, a, a bright star with, that you know is that true point source in order to create the corrections. Turns out you can do that if you propagate a laser to the upper atmosphere, there's a layer of sodium. And if you excite it, it will glow and you can essentially create an artificial star. So that's what the lasers are doing. And that's what we use when we're looking at the galactic center. Um, it also makes for these great videos. Um, so there's a, a particular research team that again has been using Keck for a very long time to monitor positions at the center of uh, the Milky Way galaxy. And here's a nice little animation. So this is a picture with adaptive optics off. This is being done at infrared wavelengths. So you can see through the gas and dust. And this is what the same image looks like at adaptive optics on. So again, you see not just sharper stars, but you're seeing the fainter ones in the background that you couldn't see without adaptive optics as well. So now we can measure the positions of those stars. And they have mapped this out. I'm just gonna set this animation in motion. By mapping the positions of those stars over time, we find that they're orbiting something. And of course the punchline that everybody knows is coming is that this is the supermassive black hole at the center of the galaxy. And um, it's an interesting story because this is a project that um, the, the, the leader of this team, Andrea Gez, when she first started proposing this, nobody thought it was really doable. This is early days of adaptive optics. In fact, her first uh, observations used a slightly different technique. Um, but this team has been doing it now for again, close to 25 years. And they've gone beyond just looking at the orbit and saying, aha, there's something that's really, really massive at this point. And that massive thing isn't shining. It doesn't show up in the image at any wavelength. Uh, therefore it must be a black hole with a, a given mass, with the mass that they can calculate from the orbits. But now, because we've done full orbits of some of these over the years, they're actually looking for precession effects for stars around the black hole at the same level that subtle errors in the uh, orbit, the precession of Mercury around the sun showed that I, uh, uh, Newton's theory of gravity didn't quite work. They're testing Einstein's theory of general relativity, Einstein's description of gravity at that same level. And just a few years ago, they, they got enough data and they're actually able to test Einstein and it passed. Like everything went pretty much exactly as, as Einstein's theory described it. And of course this led to the uh, no prize in physics just uh, in 2020. Um, and it's actually, you know, went from, you know, one person's very, very small project to this very big team. She brought the whole team out a few years ago to visit the observatory. You can see them there in the upper left. Um, but this has been fantastic to watch uh, from the point of view of the observatory, because we've known these people for decades as they've come out to see us. And it's very, very satisfying when at least something this big and, you know, obviously with a Nobel Prize this important. So another area uh, that Keck does a lot of work, especially through our connection with NASA is planetary science. So again, I'll highlight adaptive optics. This is uh, Uranus with and without adaptive optics. So you can see the rings of Uranus and you can see um, 
weather systems. You can see the bands on the planet. You can see these you know, bright white spots, which are little storms, just like we sometimes watch on Jupiter. Um, and I want to highlight one that was fun just because I was actually there for this observation. In fact, I wasn't working. I was, um, I was assigned time on a different telescope on the mountain, but I was observing in the second half of the night. So the first half of the night, I was up on the summit because this telescope has you go up to the summit to observe. And I didn't have anything to do. So I wandered over to CAC to go chat with my friends who are running things. And this happened to be what was going on. So I'll show you. So first of all, this is literally me taking my cell phone and taking pictures of the screen. So that's why they're a little fuzzy. Um, this is a calibration star for adaptive optic system. Again, this is an infrared wavelength. That's a diffraction ring from a star from a 10 meter telescope right there. So we're literally using the, the Keck telescopes at the diffraction limit. And the science they were doing is this. So you're getting a double image here because of the particular way we take data. But this is an image of Io, Jupiter's moon Io. And you can see the little bright spots on Io itself. This is data taken in the infrared. So these are hot spots, they're temperature hot spots on Io. These are active volcanic eruptions on Io. Um, so this research team, this is Imke de Potter there on the right and Catherine de Clear there on the left. Um, they've been monitoring Io and monitoring volcanic eruptions on Io over time to try and understand where the volcanoes erupt because that tells you something about the interior of the moon, the interior structure. And they can map the, the um, volcanoes over time. They put them on this and they compared this to theories. And so apparently there were two competing theories of the interior structure and how it would be formed. And they each had different predictions of how things would come out the poles versus the equator and all this. The beautiful thing was, is that they did this research, they monitored it over time and they created this map and it looks nothing like either of the theories, which is for a scientist, one of the more exciting results that you can get it means there's something really interesting going on here. So real quick, some of the things going forward, we actually have instruments now that blend imaging and spectroscopy. Um, KCWI, which I showed you the picture of at the beginning is one of them. And it does both at the same time. So what you get at the end is a data cube. You get for every pixel in your image, you actually have a spectrum of what's on that pixel. And it's really cool how this is done. There's a few techniques, but this is a picture of the optics deep inside of KCWI. This is actually during manufacture before they were aluminized. But these are, are tiny. I mean, you can see the, the you know, roughly quarter 20 bolt heads that are, that are there in the image. And these are called image slicers. What they do is each little row of that is a mirror and each one is turned slightly relative to one another. So you put this right at focus where you might otherwise put a camera. And so you're taking sort of the top row of the image and sending it over there. You're taking the next row of the image and sending it over there all the way down. And you take each one of those slices of the image and you essentially send it through a spectrograph. So you can then, once you take the data, you can reassemble that in software into a 3D cube. <clears throat> and what this is meant to do, this is one of our newest instruments, is it was built to look at the cosmic web, which if you look at the very, very distant universe, we're seeing back in time, of course. And the very most distant, faintest things we can see are some of the earliest structures in the universe. And we actually want to see the faint tendrils of material flowing into form. And so that's what this was built to do. It was built to watch the assembly of the very earliest galaxies and galaxy clusters in the universe. And um, they have actually done this and we are actually starting to get the first science results coming out of this. We got, I got this quote uh, from a paper from two years ago. Um, for the first time, we were seeing filaments of gas directly spiral into a galaxy, you should say, in the early universe in this case. And the image on the right is actually a computer simulation. It's really hard to visualize this data and show it in a clever way in a presentation, unfortunately. I'll show you one other example of the same thing. There's an instrument called SCALES, which is under construction right now. The Santa Cruz Array of Lenslets for Exoplanet Science. And it's designed to work um, not on the distant universe, but on exoplanets. And again, it works in the infrared. So it does the same thing that I showed you before with the images of the planet, except that now every pixel in that image would be a spectrum. And this is what the raw data simulated in this case, because the instrument's still under construction, looks like. So each of those little streaks is one pixel out of the image, but the streak is the spectrum. 
And so you obviously you need software to take this all apart and then reassemble it in a cube. What's neat about scales is that um, when you look at a star, kind of like what we did before. So this picture on the right is the equivalent of what I showed you before. And you're seeing all the little blobs of light from the imperfectly corrected uh, seeing. And how do you differentiate between you know, those, those blobs, we call them speckles, and a real planet? Well, if you have a full data cube, this animation here is not an animation in time, it's an animation in wavelength. So you're stepping through the wavelengths. And what you see, if you look carefully, is that you're seeing the diffraction pattern that's expanding because lambda over D, as you change lambda, the shape changes. But if you are very, very keen eyed, you can see that a speckle, which is circled in red, which is from the seeing, moves outward because it changes with lambda. A planet, which is circled in green, doesn't. And so this is how we're going to be able to easily differentiate planets from, you know, again, that, that noise, the speckle noise around stars, and then also get a spectrum of them at the same time. So this is uh, an instrument, like I said, it's just under construction, and we're looking forward to seeing this in sort of five years or so. So I'll just wrap up there. Thanks for your patience. And just because it's fun, I'm going to put on this movie, which is just more of those nighttime time lapses from not just tech, but everything up on the summit of Mount Akea. And I'm happy to take some questions. I can just feel the whole collective brain scale here of our audience just going question after question. But just remind everyone that when Keck was built, Keck 1 was an experiment. Yeah. In itself, no one knew if uh, putting 18 segments together and actuators would actually work. And now it's the de facto standard for all very large telescopes that James Webb, of course, and the 30 meter telescope someday. Um, but... Yeah, in fact, uh, James Webb has poached a number of our people, as has you know the, the next generation telescopes like TMT. And all in right. fact, um, oh, about four or five months ago, the some of the folks from JWST uh, came to observe at Keck, not to do science, but to test their backup plan for phasing the telescope mirrors if their initial system didn't work on deployment. Oh. And so they took one of our instruments and they told our engineers to basically mess up your mirror. And it was their problem to try and figure out how to unmess it up um, using only the cameras that they had, using not the instrument that is designed to do that exact job. Um, so they were using us as a test bed for some of their technology. Everything here is all cutting edge. And I remember when the, the two telescopes were used together as one large project for NASA. And I remember when it was dis, discommissioned, decommissioned as well, too, because I got to visit the lab where all those beams and computers were used to time, sense time array, time phase, the two light pass into one. Yeah, there's a lot of fun stuff to talk about. The interferometer is this whole era in Keck, which is really fascinating. I mean, you know, I had to pick these science highlights that I thought were kind of fun. I skipped one of the Nobel prizes that was done with Keck. Like that's how hard it is to come up with a with a sort of coherent list here that fits in a, in a nice little short presentation. And for me, as just an amateur, as a volunteer, I was there. I had dinner with Andrea Getz. And it took me 20 half minutes, a half an hour before I realized who she was, because in real life, she's much shorter than she appears to be the, the giant of science that she is on all the discovery programs and NOVA things that we have been seeing her. And we finally got her at our home university here at Wesley. And after years and years of schedule conflicts to do a presentation uh, for our Sturm Memorial Lecture just a few years back. And I got another question here from uh, Bob Janus. Are the two, two telescopes ever used as a two element array for imaging? Yes, it's an interferometer. And it was like $10 million for, uh, for some period of time to keep it operating. Yeah. And it had NASA, yeah, NASA funded that for a number of years because they wanted to do more technology demonstration. At the time, they were being very ambitious and they wanted to do a space based interferometer like that to look at planets around other stars. Um, I think the realities of budget scaled that expectation back, or at least pushed it back a few decades. But um, yeah, that was a NASA project for a number of years, but sadly decommissioned. And, and we know the engineer who was 
basically the one who started taking it apart together and maintained it too. Former president of West YA Astronomy Club, Andrew Cooper. Yeah. Um, but people, if you'd like to speak up, raise your hand in the chat or you know, speak, type through the chat, feel free, this is your opportunity. Or in the participants list, you can raise your hand or however that works. And then you can raise your hand on reactions is one of the places you can do it. Or just say, hey, Josh, what would you like to ask? Yeah, so I can't see the chat. So I'll just, you know, something about there, please, please read it okay. out. Yeah, I'll, I'll take a look for that. But you, there's a reactions button on the bottom of your screen for it says raise hand if you have a question, if you don't want to speak. Um, shout out, that is. Anyone? Is it a dusty environment up there? It looks, you know, the, the terrain looks kind of uh, very uh, sandy or, or lava, lava or dust or whatever. Yeah, so it's, it's a lava cinder. Um, and there are good and bad aspects to that. So it's not as dusty as other locations. But what dust there is, is very fresh and hence very sharp. So we have to, you know, if, if we do have dusty conditions, we tend to close the telescope. Um, to be honest, that's extremely rare for us. Um, uh, when I was a grad student, I observed a number of times at Apache Point, which is in New Mexico, it's a three and a half meter, and they're up above white sands. Uh, and so when the things were just right, they would get a lot of dust elevated up to their, uh, their elevation up there in the mountains uh, from white sands, and they would have to close. Um, but fortunately, we don't have a lot of dust problems. We have occasionally had problems uh, from uh, sulfur emissions from Kilauea volcano when they reached the elevation. Um, mm. So Kilauea uh, has been erupting nearly continuously for several decades now. And there was a particularly um, strong eruption in 2018 that closed us a number of nights because uh, sulfur when combined with moisture, S and then the, the oxygen from moisture makes um, sulfuric acid, which is not good for telescope coatings. So we had to, to close on a number of nights. And since we we actually didn't have a, a sensor for that particular uh, uh, contaminant, let's say, that was uh, available to be quantitative, we actually had the telescope operators go outside and if they could smell sulfur, they were supposed to close. Mm. I tell one uh, instruments or set of telescopes that did not do well with dust, and that was the James Clerk Maxwell. They had to shut down anytime it was very dusty, and they were one of the few telescopes up there that could image during the daytime. Okay, I got two more questions. Two, actually, two, one two parter. Would you provide your thoughts about the proliferation of Starlink satellites? And the other one is the ugly one in the room. Uh, what's the current situation with the indigenous Hawaiians? So on Starlink. It's, it's an interesting question. I'll say this, from, from a purely Keck-centric point of view, it's not actually gonna be that bad for us. Because we do spectroscopy, we're usually looking at a very, very narrow patch of sky. And so if something just comes through very, very quickly, there's not enough time you know, as it passes through, say your spectrograph slit, to dump a lot of light. You know, this is in comparison to a big wide field image where it's, you know, shooting through there and essentially it's taking a whole streak of your pixels and just knocking those out. Um, so just by the nature of the science we're doing, of the types of instruments we're doing, Starlink won't be too bad. I'm worried as an astronomer about its effects on other projects. And one that hasn't gotten a ton of press is radio astronomy. Um, you know, this is a lot of broadcasts and it's... You know, in principle, they're using wavelengths that you know shouldn't interfere with with radio astronomy. But when you're mass producing a thing, sometimes it's not produced quite as well. And in fact, the iridium satellites, which some of you may uh, be familiar with from iridium flares, um, one of the problems we had with them in astronomy was that it turns out that their radio transmitters were just not quite built as well as they should have been. And they bled a lot into wavelengths that were protected for radio astronomy. So they were a real problem. And that was 60 something. I can't remember how many iridium satellites there are. You can imagine what would happen if there were tens of thousands with just a little problem uh, in their transmitters. 
Um, and then when it comes to the TMT situation, yeah, it's it's been challenging. And I, I will say that one of the frustrating things, you know, living here and watching the sort of broader coverage is that it is usually reduced to a, the native Hawaiians think this. That's not the reality of it. The reality of it is that some native Hawaiians have objections to astronomy on the mountain. Quite a good number do not, but people who aren't angry don't end up in the news. Um, so it's it's definitely you know an issue here. I mean, it's something that we've been working with you know local groups and you know the the government and all of that. Um, I'm optimistic about things moving forward, partially because that when you really get down to it, the the protests against TMT. For the most part, again, I'll say, you know, there's a lot of people involved with lots of different opinions. This is not the key thing. This is a symbol and it's a convenient symbol, right? I mean, this is a, a highly visible thing on top of a mountain. It makes a beautiful symbol for, you know, whatever you're trying to, to rail against. Um, and that there, there are a lot of issues here. Um, there's this whole backlog with um, the Hawaiian homeland system, which is a big, long story. And it's basically been mismanaged and they are very, very right to be upset with that. We don't have anything to do with that. And that's the frustrating part. So I, I think that from a lot of the protesters perspectives, one of the goals was to get attention, mission accomplished. My hope is, is that now between all the stakeholders in the state, some of the actual root problems can be sort of addressed to some degree and that will make at least some people happy. Um, so like I said, I, I, I'm optimistic just because I think we're, we're a symbol of a problem. We're not the problem. Okay. Um, there was another question going on is does seismic activity ever bother the observing instruments sorry jeff b i am laughing because i remember that just from the time i was there uh go ahead <laughs> short answer is yes yes um, we so the there was an earthquake in 2006 that actually took us offline for a couple of months that was a 6.7 i think magnitude um related to to the volcano to kilauea um, there's another sure. earthquake in 2018 related to the eruption that didn't take us off for quite as long, uh, just because it was a touch further away. Um, but we get small earthquakes from the time and we have a whole uh, system to measure acceleration, you know, at the pier of the telescope, essentially. And based upon whether it exceeds a certain threshold, we know whether we have to stop and just halt everything until we can do a thorough inspection. But if it's below a threshold, which most of them are, um, we basically just reacquire our guide star and move on. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, I guess I'll just repeat this question, even though I'm answering it. The question is, from Bob Hammond, he was in the area seven years ago, but didn't have time to visit the facility. Is a visitor access policy now? Um, so, yeah, I've already so, told him that there are no planned or public stargazing programs anymore. It's, the Viz is basically there for hikers, but that doesn't mean you can't visit. Yeah, and I, I'm in contact with the, the new manager of his, and he wants to restart the nighttime observing, but with COVID restrictions and, you know, like the current Omicron spike kind of threw the plans that he and I talked about into, into chaos. So I, not right now, but I'm, I'm hopeful that we'll be seeing a nightly observing program at the Viz again Is sometime in the new, vaguely new future. Manager? Is this a new yeah. manager? Yeah, he just started this past year, um, and I know him. He's worked on the island for a long time. He's done outreach through Pisces, if you're familiar with that project. He's a really good guy. I'm really pleased with that hire. I somebody I might know? Uh, Rodrigo Romo. Hmm, no, don't, don't yeah. sound familiar. Well, that's encouraging. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm encouraged. Yeah, we've been through three different managers of this just in the short period of time I volunteered. Um, 
What was I just going to say? Oh, I had a question back to your the laser guide star. Uh, back in the early days of that, I had friends that w literally worked as laser spotters. This job it was is to raise a red flag when there was a um, plane in the area, or you could had to shut it down when there was a rocket launch from another nation. The, the Chinese didn't necessarily let us know when that was happening. On, but I know that stopped, but I can't remember why it stopped because you didn't need it anymore. Um, essentially, yeah, we, we have to protect uh, two things when we operate the laser. Um, airplanes, so we don't want to blind the pilot, and uh, satellites. The U.S. military in particular doesn't want us blinding any of their satellites. Um, so there's two ways to do that. First is the um, everything we observe that is using the laser guide star, we have to, several days ahead of time, submit that to uh, Space Command in Colorado Springs. And they send us back a list and says, turn it off at these times. And that's what we do. Um, when it comes to airplanes, um, the old method was visual detection of airplanes. We have a number of years ago now, I think before I started working at Keck, switched to a transponder based detection system. So we have a, a little uh, transponder receiver literally mounted behind the secondary mirror of the telescope that looks upward. And if it detects any airline transponders within certain distances, you know, does all the geometry, then it just puts a shutter in front of the laser. Oh, automation. Very cool. Some of those people were really interesting characters, as you might admit, and managed to had to sit out there with a lawn chair and cold, warm beverage and keep an eye on the sky. Yeah, Different that was a, a tough job. Yeah. Uh, now, did I answer to everybody's satisfaction some of the questions I didn't Oh, I did miss one from Chris Markevich. Have you seen any effects from the Tonga volcano explosion? Um, yes, so a couple of things have been identified, nothing particularly negative. Um, one is that all the weather stations basically recorded the passage of the shockwave. In fact, um, even in my home weather station, I was able to, to look in the data and I could see the, the shockwave both. So the shockwave goes out, I saw the initial pass, the backside of the shockwave came around and I detected that. And then the original shockwave going around a second time. And you can see that on all the weather stations. Um, somebody else uh, went ahead and looked at the, um, so the pictures like I was showing there with the time lapse, there's some cameras um, at Gemini. Um, we're actually putting in similar ones this year that do the same thing. They're basically DSLRs just pointed at the horizon taking images so you can look for um, you know, oncoming clouds and stuff, but they're, they're nightscape images. I mean, they're beautiful. Um, and you can see sky glow, those little, you know, sort of typically reddish bands of light that go passing over. And, and those are quote unquote gravity waves. They're, they're waves in the atmosphere. And there was a particularly um, bright set of those that came by at the appropriate time uh, that you could actually see in the Gemini cloud camera. You just see this little rippling band of, of red uh, air glow waves going past. And again, that was, that was the pressure wave. I don't have any more questions in the chat. Uh, any one need follow up from any answers that I may have provided? It's nice to hear the new manager is at the Viz now. That's really encouraging. At the really height of the program there, we had 200 visitors a night and we had up five, six telescopes and, and whacked members of their personal telescopes up a set up on the Lanai, um, just operating to keep the people happy, keep them coming and going. The lines are 14 deep, just those number of scopes. Plus we did summit tours and those are, that was the first program to get canceled. Any other questions? Not Josh, I really appreciate it. that was one of the most informative things, especially I, I appreciated it because I saw things change over the two decades of me being around there and knowing people that work there. And it's fascinating to see all the stuff that changes and all the new instruments. Oh yeah, it's, yeah, no, it's, it's an ever evolving, you know, effort at the observatories, you're always, you know, trying to get new instrumentation, new techniques and doing new types of sciences. You know, we figure things out. It's a lot of fun. Never get bored. Well, 
Let's give uh, Josh a regional astronomy club. Thank you for uh, yeah. taking the time to share his expertise with us in that fabulous program. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. So you. That was Thank tremendous. You. Right. You Thanks, know, everyone. The, Thank you very much. With all the news with the uh, James Webb telescope, you know, we kind of forget that, that, that there's some really, uh, you know, pretty incredible technology, you know, here. Uh, Diana, that, that, that's been here for years, too. That really, that really knocked my socks off. Thank you so much. Oh, I'm, yeah, I was happy to do it. In fact, JWST is this whole other fun topic. Um, there's there's going to be a lot of synergy between JWST and Keck. The same way I didn't get to go into this. When Hubble was first launched, it was, you know, same time frame as Keck first yeah. came online. And a lot of science used the two together. We're expecting mm -hmm. more of the same with JWST. Mm -hmm. Now you might see the chat, but if not, Bethany's thank you, Liam is thanking you, Bob's thanking you, and Eslin. Uh, Mayako, thank you so much for coming. All right. And look forward Thanks, to seeing everyone. you next WAC meeting. All right. Good night, everyone. Great. Good night. Thank you. Thanks again, Josh.